Hello and welcome to Shop Talk Live. On the program this afternoon, we're joined by Joe Barrett, Chief Operating Officer at Apple Green, Sophia Nadur, Marketing and Innovation Director, Advanced Mobility Unit at BP, Warren Walmart, the Chief Executive Officer of On The Run Australia, and Paula Thomas, the Chief Content Officer at Liquid Barcodes. Dan, over to you. Well, welcome to The Last Mile, The Future Shape of Convenience and Fuels Retail. We've got a very interesting program for you today. Um, today, we're going to look at technology in the last mile, but we're also looking at three triple disruptions that, um, that we've all been uh, aware of for some time in energy, mobility and retail. But the question we're asking today is, uh, have those disruptions themselves being disrupted and one question in the back of our mind as we go through the next 45 minutes will be to ask ourselves whether the life of the uh, fuel filling station uh, has actually been extended because of some of the changes that we're starting to see emerge um, from the uh, as, as the pandemic runs its course around the world and uh, and shapes um, shapes our industry so um, first up uh, we've got a 10 minute presentation from Paula Thomas, who's Chief Contents Officer at Liquid Barcodes and uh, a very famous loyalty podcaster. So Paula, if, um, if I could welcome you onto, uh, onto the pro program. Nice to be here. Hi, Dan. Well, welcome back and nice to see, nice to see you too. So you're, you're, you're as ever in Dubai. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And nice to be described as a famous podcaster. Well, I think it's true. Um, uh, you, you, certainly, uh, certainly true. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to be talking about today, um, Paula? Absolutely, Dan. Well, I suppose first and foremost, um, as you know, I've been working on the operations side of loyalty programs for probably over a decade. And one of the biggest pain points I had, Dan, was being able to find affordable rewards in physical form. And I mean things like coffee and chocolate that convenience retailers offer, but being able to find convenience retailers that could supply them to me in a safe and secure way was always a challenge. So uh, Liquid Barcodes has actually built a solution for a client, which I've just written about. Uh, so delighted to talk through an example of solving that problem. Okay, well, let's, um, let's, let's hear more about it. Great stuff. Okay, so um, I think from your side as well, Dan, you saw a huge amount of interest in the article itself. Um, when I wrote it literally just a couple of weeks ago, um, we literally called it Surprise and Delight at Scale. So as you can imagine with loyalty programs, we're all about surprise and delight and doing it at scale brings a huge amount of operational challenges. So the article is a way for convenience retailers to actually start to sell to loyalty program managers and HR managers. So I think we'll all agree that the convenience industry traditionally just focuses on B2C. It's a one 100% consumer market. So this is a completely different idea. And for anyone who is interested, the full article is on your website to read through in detail. Yeah, so tell us a bit about this, this case study in terms of, because there was a lot of interest in it. And I think obviously the, the attraction is not just thinking about B2C, which is obviously what uh, every retailer does, but looking at these large corporate clients suddenly, because yeah. this is something that is, is quite appealing to them, isn't it? It totally is, Dan. And as you know, in the UK, for example, O2 Priority is a huge loyalty program. It's been running for over a decade. So I ran that particular program in the Irish market, did some work with Joe's team actually in Apple Green. He's obviously coming up. But particularly what we wanted, as I said, Dan, was we started with a reward strategy where we were shipping out rewards to our top customers and obviously giving them data and calls and all of that. But as the company was changing ownership, we found that we wanted to do something that was a bit more special and we didn't have a huge budget actually. So we realized something like coffee or chocolate was almost universal when it came to rewarding our customers. And when we did our loyalty metrics, we actually found that gifting those kind of products with convenience retail partners really gave us extraordinary results on the loyalty metrics. So it was a superb opportunity for us. Yeah, yeah, very good. 
Cool. So if Nick wants to click on then the particular article, as I said, is based on Press Byron, which is the leading convenience and kiosk retailer in Sweden. Now, many of you will know, I suppose, that Scandinavia is also considered a very advanced market. So I'm super excited to see that Press Byron is also taking this particular opportunity. So Press Byron, just obviously many people know, but for those who don't, is part of the right hand group who are one of the largest um, convenience retailers in Europe, but they're really across Scandinavia and the Baltics. Um, with yeah. uh, They operate the 7-Eleven brand as well as uh, Press Byron uh, and other brands as well. Great, thanks for that, Dan. So absolutely, so Press Byron realized the potential to sell convenience products in bulk to the corporate market, and certainly the first in Sweden to do that. So essentially what they did was launch a corporate coupon store that enables the sale of digital vouchers um, in bulk for particular customers. And I'll talk you through exactly the type of customers that they're going to be selling those to. What this um, image shows you is the type of products that Press Byron Byron has decided will be appealing to, again, mass market. So members of loyalty programs or also potentially employees of companies. So if you think of the mindset of those particular people, they might want to be able to gift something like a coffee and a cake, something like an ice cream, which on the right there, as you can see, is super affordable. And in the middle, thanks Nick, is literally a lunch package, which is a little more expensive as a reward, but a very good range of solutions to offer to those corporate clients so a large corporate client say has 3,000 employees it like it would like to do something nice for those employees to treat them if you like and it needs yeah. an easy solution that's uh, that's that's very transparent and easy and uh, and effective and, and will be taken up by those um by those employees Totally, Dan. And sometimes in my experience, it's something that's part of the, you know, recurring something that happens every quarter or on particular occasions. But increasingly, what we're seeing is more and more want to do it maybe when the sun suddenly comes out and you suddenly decide, OK, let's have an ice cream for everybody. Let's change the energy. Let's celebrate a particular um, opportunity. So that's the type of thing this type of technology facilitates. Very, very good. Great stuff. So as I said, the solution addresses a pain point for many loyalty programs and many HR departments. Um, in my experience, I went around lots of them. And what I was particularly tasked with was rewarding hundreds, if not thousands of customers in a safe and secure and surprising way. And what always happened was I had a significant rewards budget approved and ready to spend. And as you can imagine, Dan, that increased and decreased over time, but it was always pre-allocated and available. And really what I wanted was to gift an everyday reward, such as coffee or chocolate. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and just, I suppose, at the time, certainly very few retailers had a solution and technology in place for, for corporate coupons. And I spent an awful lot of time, and I mean in one example, up to a year, trying to negotiate, persuading a retailer to put this in place so I could buy products from particular brands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to see this spreading across the Nordic countries. I mean, I'd be interested if it's worked, uh, as, as we asked this question, uh, we discussed this before, but I'd be interested in if, if this has worked elsewhere in the world, but it's certainly something which is getting a lot of attention across the Nordic countries right now, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think we were saying also, Dan, that neither of us have really seen it, particularly, I don't think, in the UK. So, so I'll talk you through why it works. Yeah. Um, so first and foremost, I suppose from a loyalty industry and, and from a podcasting perspective, we talk a lot about a trend towards micro rewards or everyday rewards. And that really is led by budget. So that is one of the key success factors for this particular concept, but also flexibility. What we love to be able to do as loyalty managers is give somebody the opportunity, for example, to choose their favorite bar of chocolate. The other really important point about this idea is the benefits of self-collection. So if you are trying to reward um, members of your loyalty program, what you don't want to do is be spending money on postage or time. So obviously, if the customer is going into a convenience store, picking up whatever it is, that they're going to enjoy free of charge. It's a really beautiful customer experience. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. okay. Thanks. 
Yeah, and then the, the key point is that it's obviously safe and secure. So again, a lot of older technologies didn't have unique uh, codes or coupons. So this solution for Best Buy Run absolutely has that safe and secure. And really what it has created for them is a unique selling point to be able to go out to these big companies and offer this solution. Well, I mean, everyone likes new customers, but I suppose if that new customer effectively means 3,000 people and they've already got a budget and they're just struggling to spend it, um, yes. They're a particularly interesting customer for, you know, for our industry, aren't they? It's a high quality problem, Dan. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Great. So I'll just quickly go through how it works. So first of all, the technology is very basic. It's all done on our side by simply adding an iframe to an existing website. It is simply an e-commerce store. The type of companies that are likely to want these type of micro rewards would be banks or insurance companies, utilities I mentioned such as telecoms, TV broadband, even newspaper media and car dealers and travel and transportation. They're the type of companies running loyalty programs. What I've also found is even though they might not always have budget, they do have long-term recurring needs. So once you get in and start and they understand how easy it is to avail of this solution, they tend to come back every time they do have a budget available. Do, do they, just, just out of interest, do they tend to get approached, uh, need an approach to, to get going? Obviously, once they're customers, they're, they're, they could potentially be very long-term customers, but does it normally take an initial approach to get, to get them in? Absolutely. Yeah. Just to explain the whole concept, show them how easy it is. Again, we all know we want easy solutions. So absolutely. It does need to be sold B2B in the first instance. Got it. Okay. So just the customer journey, your client chooses which product they want and how many coupons they need. They choose whether they want printed uh, coupons or digital to send out by email or SMS. And then they're literally sent an email confirming the order details and the receipt. And obviously the coupons are sent immediately. So again, gives you that opportunity to be reactive. And the person then who receives the coupon comes into your store, scans the coupon at the point of sale, picks up their free rewards and off they go. Very straightforward then. Absolutely. And this is a lovely example. I know Press Byron are doing loads with ice cream uh, in, in Sweden. So what kind of products do the corporate customers typically choose? You know, is it, is it, a, is it a, is the ice cream, is an ice cream quite typical of, of what they'd normally want to reward their, their employees with? It's a great question, Dan, because I did try and do, for example, healthy rewards for one particular client, like smoothies and juices. But we found actually that chocolate was the number one every time. And coffee is always a winner. And again, you have the flexibility to give tea or hot chocolate and allow the customer to choose exactly what they want. So um, it's got to be a treat for the employees or they won't appreciate it. Totally. Something that they really feel, oh, yeah, I deserve this. You know, it is a reward. Fair enough. So yeah, the final point I wanted to say is we did ask Press Byron what convinced them to focus on digital coupons for corporate customers. And quite simply, what they told us um, was that their company's ambition is actually to spread joy, constantly develop and dare to think new and to think ahead for tomorrow's customers. So whereas many convenience stores might not be doing B2B now, it's definitely something they see as very important for the future. And here's a lovely quote at the end. It's exciting to find an idea we can be the first to bring to our customers, something that is compelling and creative, but also creates new commercial opportunities. Well, it's working in the Nordics. It'd be very interesting to see if this takes off elsewhere, won't it? Absolutely. That's it. Great, great. great. Well, well, thanks very much for your time, Paula. Um, right. Always a pleasure. And we're going to be, hopefully you can listen to the rest of the program. We're going to be very much talking about tomorrow's customers. Um, and uh, technology is, 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 is runs through everything in, in the session today. So thanks very much. Appreciate your time. Um, I'd like to welcome Sophia. Uh, Sophia, uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, we've got you back a second time. So um, you must have enjoyed it the first time, I hope. Yeah, I did. Uh, so you, you spend, uh, you're very much uh, focused on mobility. Um, you're, you're always posting on it and always very informative and, and knowledgeable about what's going on globally. One of the areas that you do speak a lot about, um, uh, Sophia, is, is, is the last mile and delivery in particular. And um, you, you posted something recently looking at all the big sort of M&A moves that have happened in the delivery space. And maybe you, rather than me, you know, uh, sort of remind you of your post, tell us a bit about what, what the big moves have been lately in, in delivery with some of the big operators globally. 
I mean, uh, thanks very much, Dan, for having me again. So if you think of the um, of the uh, global delivered convenience market, it's about a hundred and thirty billion dollar market and it's growing. And this is even prior to COVID. Uh, the big players are Takeaway, which is a, a Dutch-based company, which has been doing a number of M&As over the last few years. Just Eat is one of their subsidiaries. Grubhub, which was recently part of an M&A out to the US. Skip the Dishes is a Canadian company. And then um, uh, Menulog, which is an Australian company, is also one of their subsidiary partnership uh, So they made companies. some massive acquisitions. So Takeaway, Dutch-based, made some massive acquisitions yeah. of all these names that we're all so familiar with. Yes. And are they the biggest player in the world right now? Yeah, I, I mean, it's hard to say because you don't you don't have uh, numbers, but I would say they're probably one of the biggest. Uh, you've got the Chinese company, uh, Meituan uh, Dianping, which is also quite big. They're about 10, 10 11, uh, $12 billion company. So I would say it, it's between uh, Deliveroo, Takeaway, and uh, Meituan Dianping. And of course, you can't ignore uh, Uber and Uber Eats. No. So just obviously, we, we're all very much aware of these businesses and obviously some been some big M&A moves, as, as, as you've just mentioned. Um, what has the impact of the pandemic been on on these businesses and, and have they benefited or have they suffered? I mean, what's what's gone on? I think as, as we all, as many of us have moved to more a digital way of working and we've been, so our place of work has often been our home or near to our home. So it hasn't been in the urban centers as it used to be, or it hasn't been in sort of a, an area where you would have uh, food and convenience products available, literally uh, just underneath your offices. Uh, we're seeing quite a, a strong growth in delivered convenience, um, partly because of the initial stage of the pandemic where it was very difficult for people to get out to shops and so instead you need to have uh, delivered food but also delivered conven uh, convenience products to your home. I think once people are starting to get quite comfortable with the idea of uh, online ordering of food and convenience and other types of products it's becoming much more commonplace now than before. So for instance before you might have gone out to a restaurant but now it's quite comfortable for you to order in and enjoy your food at home or in the, in the case of uh, companies like HelloFresh where it's a food ingredient company which delivers uh, ingredients to make uh, meals uh, out of uh, simple recipes. Um, we're seeing as well a growth in that area too because of course even though you can get to the shops but actually because you're living more of a digital work life you're finding less time actually to, to spend cooking which is an odd thing. A lot of your cooking is done on the weekends now and so actually having that extra bit of convenient help has actually spurred on the industry and so you're seeing lots of innovations and I think it's, um, it's to the benefit for the companies who've done M&A and, and have uh, kind of understood that people are looking for more and more convenient solutions. So, so they've benefited overall um, from 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 the new situation, the new the new uh, next normal, whatever we want to call it. Um, so, just thinking about it from the convenience retailer um, perspective, um, obviously a lot of convenience retailers had to find quick wins, uh, partner up with third parties, and uh, you know establish and and obviously you know make the most of those delivery uh, delivery uh, opportunities um, but is is we're we're just we're on just eat or doordash is that a strategy do you think for the long term for our sector big question yeah it's a good question. Um, I think I think you'll find maybe sort of a middle ground. So as people get back out and uh, enjoying uh, leisure time and rediscovering restaurants, and of course in the UK you've had this uh, Eat Out to Help Out program, which has been phenomenal success. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you'll probably get a new balance where you will still get uh, perhaps perhaps your your Friday evening or your Saturday evening may go back out of home, but you may now start to think about uh, perhaps midweek or especially evenings to actually uh, bring 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 finished food home so I see I think that's here to stay and I think it's not just about food finished food but again food ingredients but like what we are seeing um, in, in our gas station so in the BP gas stations we've got uh, 13 odd thousand shops in uh, in the UK and and we've done some trials as well and some programs with uh, delivery of convenience food and th the interesting is, is that as people people are working in their patterns are different. Uh, I mean, our gas stations are, uh, let's say, uh, 90 to 95% of the population live within a 20 minute um, uh, radius of a, of, a, of a gas station. And so the whole way of delivering and distribution is changing. So it's making that business model more cost efficient as well.
yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the sort of latest moves um, with uh, the, the, the door dashes of this world, if you like, in the US um, have established a um, virtual store, uh, they call Dash Mart in six yeah. US cities. Um, yeah. And obviously they can undercut some of the c people who would have been their third party customers, if you like, in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, what, what they can do. Do you think that's something which is only probably for the urban centers, maybe where there aren't many convenience stores anyway? It's, it, it, you're right. It's funny because you, I mean, that sort of virtual store has existed in China for a few years. It's been in Japan. I've seen it in Dubai. If anybody has been into Dubai, some of the, uh, some of the uh, train stations you see that kind of virtual store. I think there is a, there is a place for it. It's probably quite an impulse type of, uh, of product that will sell off of it. I think, I think what you'll see is that there, there are lots of different uh, routes to market, so routes to the consumer. So this is just uh, one way of offering it. Um, I, I, what, you, what we're seeing too is that with this whole post-pandemic new world people are also wanting things from their local community so it's how do you how do you balance out what's available perhaps locally with what might be available mass market at a virtual store like a dash door I, I think you'll end up with a, a number of different uh, business models which will suit different use cases and so it, it's quite quite an exciting time even though it's it's a pandemic but it's quite an exciting time if you're a business manager rethinking your business models uh, yeah, people are I, people I are changing behaviors that. I can certainly yeah. agree with that. Um, yeah. One, one last question on this, really, and it was, I mean, the article that I think you posted was, was looked at the, um, the CEO of, um, of, of Takeaway's position on, on, on his staff and how, and, 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 and how they were employed, how they were treated. Um, and I suppose, you know, if you think about their model, um, maybe, you know, looking after their staff better and providing a better service experience is, 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 is where they're headed. Do you think that's and it's something we should also be aware of, I think, perhaps? Do you think there's there's, there's anything in that? I think people care. I, mean, I think more and more people care, not just that they get something cheap and cheerful, but people more care a lot more than, than perhaps uh, decades ago around in terms of how it's delivered and who's delivering and whether, whether there's equity uh, in terms of uh, um, the people who are delivering, whether people are being fairly, fairly paid or fairly uh, compensated. I think you've got this model, which I, I really, really think that takeaway has, um, is onto something which is uh, quite interesting. Then of course you have all the automation area. I'm sitting in Milton Keynes where you've got Starship, you've got you've got a robotic delivery system. So you've got um, different types of delivery models that, that will that will service uh, customers in the future. But I really, I, I mean, I, I thought it was a brave move by Mr. Graham and a, a good move by him as well to, to show the market that we also have to look after the entire value chain. Because actually the last mile is where the customer interfaces with your product. So that's pretty important as well to, to make sure that you're, you're looking after uh, the, what the, the product, but also the service that's being delivered with the product itself. No, I thought that was a very interesting move. Well, well that's fascinating, Sophia, but stay with us um, because what we'd like to do is expand the discussion. And if I could invite uh, Warren Wilmot, who's the CEO at On The Run Australia, uh, you'll, know them, you'll know them well. Um, uh, welcome from, uh, welcome to, to Warren in Adelaide. Um, how are you doing, Warren? Yeah, all, all good. A bit late here, but uh, otherwise fine. Thanks. Thanks very much for joining us again. And, and also, um, I'd like to welcome Joe Barrett, who's uh, Chief Operating Officer with Apple Green, who operate in Ireland, of course, which is where Joe is, uh, but also in the UK and the US. Of, uh, Hiya, Dan. How are you doing, Joe? Hi, Warren. Hi, Sophia. It's good to Hi, see Dan. you all. So, um, Perhaps um, we're going to sort of broaden the discussion out, and I'm sure you've been listening with some interest to uh, to what we've what we've already covered, and we can we can touch on some of those things later. But perhaps we could start off. Um, Joe, can I go to you and just sort of ask? Uh, it's been a, we first spoke on Shop Talk about uh, a few months ago, back in April, when we were right mm -hmm. in the middle of of the worst month globally for 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 I guess for for not just for our industry but for many industries. It was. Uh, you know, uh, and, and we've moved on a long way since then. So perhaps, um, would you mind giving us a bit of an update on, on where Apple Green, how you see things? <clears throat> yeah, if you think back to those days, people were talking, was it a V-shaped recovery or even potentially W-shaped recoveries or hockey stick recoveries, things like that. It's interesting what we've seen is, is there's two differences, one between what I would call our motorway sites and travel plazas and then the local convenience um, store and a smaller gas filling station. And they're both very different. 
starting with the larger sort of motorway sites, what we found is they took a longer time to come back. They were, mo they were significantly impacted by the lockdown and there was dictations by government in the UK where they closed all our food offers. So we effectively went from having a very sort of strong year uh, ahead of prior year to suddenly uh, like hitting a wall and coming, coming to a stop. Um, we thankfully we're now back open again and things are trading well and I'd say we've got probably 95% of our food offers open but the customers aren't fully back and um, there's obviously no coaches there's no events things like Glastonbury uh, sports events soccer matches so there's less people traveling so it's the traffic count is down about 15 to 20 percent that that sort of number and um, but what we are finding is while there's less people coming into the stores, the people who are coming in are buying significantly more. So while we're down about 20% or so in our volumes of transactions of people coming in, you're plus 20% on the average spend in the transaction, which is interesting to see. And um, the other thing we're seeing there is a big shift towards um, payment uh, methods. So uh, cash is not totally gone, but it's significantly gone and it's people, people paying on card uh, we have an adoption rate on our kiosk unit. So do you know the uh, the order points where you can order your, your, your food and pay for it and then go and collect on the counter? That's up as high as 70% in some of the brands where people want to kind of avoid contact with other people and order it themselves. And we've also seen a big significant increase in our drive-through business where customers, again, looking for convenience and, and ease. On the other side of the business, the gas filling stations are the traditional petrol filling stations. We've seen those become much more part of the community. We've seen significant increases in grocery items, alcohol, cigarettes, people, kind of more and more people who are working at home and they're not traveling. They're, they want to go out for a walk and get to meet somebody, get out of their house for a while, buying a cup of coffee, just, just going, picking up a treat. Um, so we've seen that side of our business grow significantly well, which is, which, which is very good. So, um, so it's, it's good that we're back. The way we see it is that we're, when you look at the graphs since the start of the year and now, it is very much like a V-shaped recovery, except it's not gone right back up to 100%. It's nearly like a handle where it's somewhere between 20 and 10% that we're predicting out to the end of the year. So it is quite close to a V, but it's, it's the big unknown is what's going to happen the end of this year and into, and into next year. So budgeting and forecasting is going to be a huge, a huge issue for us. So um, overall, we would say it's interesting about this time last year, there was all these discussions about the death of the petrol billing station and will it survive and um, electric vehicles coming on board and stuff like that. Whereas now we've suddenly seen it's thriving and it was the backbone of our business during, uh, during the lockdown. Um, so I think it's this COVID-19 uh, pandemic has, has increased the life of, of the petrol filling station. Um, other things we've seen is increases in kind of like what I would call restaurant substitutes um, where people are coming in and they're buying food with us because a lot of restaurants and bars and things like that were all closed. Um, and I think there is, there, and we'll maybe get onto it later, but there'll be a, an issue for smaller coffee shops, restaurants, uh, sandwich shops, things like that, where there's less people going into cities and offices and they're going to sort of buy, buy locally. So, um, so that's, uh, that's it. If, in terms of interesting, one or two, what I would call some of the bad things, it's interesting. We were chatting to one of our colleagues in PwC the other day and he sits on the floor with over 200 people. And he said there was three people in the office. And it really gives you an insight into what's happening. People are now working from, uh, working from home. We have a couple of colleagues ourselves who have kind of given up their rent to departments in Dublin and they're now sort of um, working from home in the likes of Galway and other in Donegal and, they're, and they're, um, they're, they're able to work very effectively from, from home. So I think you're going to see lots of changes into the future. Very good, very good summary. Mm. Joe, look, we'll come back on a quite a few points there. But okay. Warren, let's bring you in and just ask for a, a sort of overview of, of where on the run is. Last time we spoke, um, you know, you were in a such a. I was obviously Austra Australia was 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 had dealt with the, had, uh, Now, obviously, there's there's certain regions of Australia which are, which are you know are in full lockdown again. Not South Australia, but it'd be great to have a 
an update from from on the runs perspective yeah now australia is a bit of a tale of two cities i, I think i for many of you know that i live actually in melbourne most of the time left my family locked up there uh, back there to uh, to come back to work uh, there's nightly curfews in melbourne uh, you're not out after 8 p.m at night uh, you can't travel more than five kilometres from your home unless you've got a working pass. Um, most businesses are, are shut down. You know, my kids have been working at home now for, for probably more than six months uh, and, and really can't go anywhere or do anything. Um, the, the numbers there are coming down, though, fairly dramatically over the last few weeks, which is very good to, to see. South Australia's had very, very few uh, active cases, very few additional cases. Uh, it might be sort of one a week if, if, you're, if you're really unlucky and that's probably someone coming into the state from either overseas or, or uh, uh, from Victoria. Um, and uh, South Australia is really open for business. Uh, a lot of what Joe was saying, we went through a period where we lost uh, uh, some customers for, for a couple of weeks, really only a couple of weeks, probably the last time we actually did this, uh, this show. Um, but they were spending more, sales weren't too bad. Um, July was probably the biggest growth month that I have seen in my time in convenience, 28 years. Um, we just, our like for like growth and like for like customer growth has just been sensational. And, and of course, you know, it's great management. Yeah, that's always the first thing you go to. Um, but I think there's a bit of post COVID uh, honeymoon, a bit of release. Uh, people have been a lot of government stimulus money, I think being spent. Uh, cigarettes for the first time in, in uh, again, probably three decades. Uh, the number of sticks we're uh, selling is probably up about 11%, uh, which is, you know, I think people uh, resorting to uh, uh, tobacco again for a bit of stress relief, but also they've got some money in their pocket to do it with. Um, just about everything else is going well. We run five different uh, quick service restaurant brands. All of them are in, in very good growth, even though that we've... Uh, uh, actually reduced trading hours on, on just about all of them as well. So, you know, touch wood, this will continue for quite a while. August looking very good. Uh, I still worry, as I said last time, a little bit about the long-term recession, unemployment. I can see Australia with 10% unemployment. They're going to have to wind back the government uh, subsidies probably by about Christmas or early into next year. Um, there's going to be a lot of businesses uh, that won't survive. Uh, they're getting a bit of financial support at the moment. You know, the, the restaurant cafe industry, especially in, in the East Coast, that was always so strong. I think there's going to be a lot of businesses go to the wall uh, in, in some of those places. And, and like that uh, PwC story that Joe just uh, mentioned, there's a lot of big offices in the centre of towns that I don't think will recover for many, many years. There's going to be repricing of, of real estate and you know, convenience stores in the suburbs hopefully become the hubs for really where people are, are working in the future. Let's just pull up, that terrific Warren, let's just pull up some photos because you very kindly, uh, we, we had, a, we had a, a pre tour, virtual tour of one of your latest sites, which was a video which a lot of the uh, audience will have seen as the, as the pre watch. But this is just one, one picture uh, of, of the drive through. So, Joe mentioned drive-through. That's also been something which has been growing for you, has it? Um, in uh, with on, uh, at on the run. Yeah. Look, um, you know the business. I've been here for two years. The business has been doing uh, some drive-through for a long time. Um, you'll see shortly a couple of pictures of, of what probably we'd call the tunnel drive-throughs. But we're putting these sorts of drive-throughs that, that are on the screen uh, onto a lot of stores now, where we we're sort of building stores or, or retrofitting stores. Uh, we're getting a huge amount of coffee being uh, pre-ordered on the app and picked up uh, in the drive-throughs. The, these last two photos are, are probably what we call the tunnel drive-throughs. Uh, I think we've got five now. We, we did have six, but we've rebuilt one um, with a uh, quick service restaurant included. Uh, big coffee sellers, big tobacco sellers, uh, absolute convenience, um, and, and customers really seem to respond to them. In future, though, we're building much more of the sort of walk-in store with big food offer uh, and the drive-through, a bit like a quick service restaurant attached to the uh, um, convenience store. Very, very interesting. Now, um, if I could bring Sophia in just to perhaps to comment, and obviously one of the, one of the, I think the, I guess the the big points that's been made, Joe made it, and I I, I raised it at the start was 
have the some of the disruptions that you've been working on, Sophia, very much uh, looking globally um, at, at energy being disrupted, retail being disrupted, the whole mobility piece, which is obviously electric vehicles, uh, is a big part of that. Um, has that been disrupted itself by, um, you know, have some of those big trends that we all accepted were coming or happening? Have they been disrupted themselves? Is the life of the petrol station um, e extended further because of, of some of these shifts? Actually, perhaps it will be. I mean, it, the, the, uh, to Joe's point, because of where petrol stations are, if in fact that many more people are actually working or, or living or, ex or uh, buying their their goods and services in let's say a twenty minute uh, um, run of it, then of course, then I then I then you can see petrol stations remaining and building on some of its let's say traditional products and services. It it already has real estate. It's just how do you then configure the real estate to suit changing needs. So as as Warren has showed, you can have a drive through. You can have new fuel options, which with with, with uh, um, for electric cars, or you can even have um, delivered convenience in and out as well. So um, in fact, I think I think the pandemic is going to enable petrol stations to to survive beyond what what looked like for a period of time. A, Bit of doom and gloom because even though the energy the energy mix will change there is still a huge convenience piece that is relevant and it's where uh, petrol stations uh, have uh, have an advantage i think uh, so i mean in a way joe i mean petrol stations mm. have proved pretty robust business model uh, through 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 the crisis haven't they Absolutely. I've been, as I said, they were rock solid. So while um, a lot of infrastructural type funds were investing in travel plazas and motorway sites because of their sort of uh, the, the nature of the business being so reliable, it's interesting. It's been our our local convenience stores and gas filling stations are the ones that have been very, very strong through the pandemic. And to, to the point Sophia, Sophia and Warren were saying there, it's interesting, I heard last week that there's apparently 7 million applicants for driving license in the UK at the moment. And there's people who are moving away from their sort of public transport and now want to kind of get cars and you can't buy a secondhand car for sort of five to 10,000 for Lugner money. So I think there will be extended life in the, in the local convenience stores. And um, I think we'll, we'll adapt for different products. Like during the, the lockdown, we sold a, a huge amount of products like um, sort of um, wood, wood for wood fire stoves. We sold a lot of plants, bedding plants, um, compost, and there's lots of other product groups that we weren't ordinarily selling a lot of that, 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 that we're selling. And I think people like to come to come to their local store rather than sort of go into big, big locations where they could meet more people. So I think there are opportunities there and you just have to keep on, on adapting our business. I'm just laughing because I visualised how my garden, our garden has changed the home since over the last six <laughs> months for the better. You know, we're, yeah. not quite, we're not quite hosting an open garden, but we almost could, you know. But, yeah. the, um, but, but let's just stay on, on one thing here, which mm -hmm. I know, um, Sophia, you're, you, you know, you've been, um, you know, very strong on over the last few years and very informed on, which is electric vehicles. So mm -hmm. um, what, what impact on, on EV adoption uh, has this had? Uh, I think that's the question. And, and Sophia first, and then Warren, and I'll come to you, Joe. Okay. Mm. Uh, it's a good question. So, I mean, for a period of time, we've not been able to go to car dealerships or any form of the other. Now, car dealerships are back open. But of course, people have now started to see uh, see mountains and hilltops that they haven't seen before because of the impact of uh, not driving on levels of pollution. So you start to see much more interest around sustainability, around around cleaner cleaner vehicles, cleaner options. And, and what you're seeing from, let's say, from the end of this year, early next year, is many more mass market electric vehicles coming onto the market. And that, I think, is going to help spur on uh, people to uh, to 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 switch to EVs. They may not actually buy an EV, they may just lease an EV. They, it may, it's different buying uh, usership models, but I think you're gonna see, uh, <clears throat> but I think the growth in uh, electric vehicles is gonna continue and accelerate further because of the overall desire for people to, to, to look for more sustainable, cleaner transport. So, so that's a, you see that, that as, a, as an accelerant. Um, what about you, you, Warren? Would you say the same in Australia? Uh, I, look, I don't think so. I, I think um, we love our uh, our uh, driving distances. We've got uh, challenge of big open spaces, etc. 
very few EVs that are being sold out here at the moment and, and not so much demand. Look, I'm sure they'll increase, so, so it's not head in the sand type stuff. It's going to be interesting in the short term because I would think that fuel pricing is going to remain pretty uh, depressed for quite some time until uh, consumption goes up around the world. Uh, so I think that'll keep people uh, happy to be driving uh, vehicles. And again, here in Australia, there's really not a lot of holidaying you can do. Uh, you know, no one from, from Melbourne can actually go on a holiday. We can't all head to Queensland for the sunshine at the moment. So I think that that's actually spurring, you know, some of the convenience consumption as well. That uh, I've got money in my pocket that I normally would sort of be spending on a trip to Bali or Thailand or whatever. So, uh, uh, you know, there is actually some more money for discretionary spend. But I don't sort of see a huge move towards um, electric vehicles in a, in a sort of concerted way for some time. We'll always be, you know, five, ten years behind the UK, I think, in any of those trends. Well, Joe, you're in a position to, to talk on that question about Ireland, the UK and the US market. So what's your view? Yeah, we, we see that the, the, the adoption rate getting faster and faster for EVs. But it's what, I, what I would say to sort of Warren's point is that in the cities, it's very strong, but out in the countries, countryside, <clears throat> where people need to commute longer distances are much more likely to get diesel cars because, because of the distance of, co of commute. So we would see it as being definitely growing um, and you're, we're seeing probably a faster adoption, but the issue is you can't get cars at the moment. And that's um, so as soon as I think the, the cars become available on a more mass market um, availability rate, I think then, then it'll adopt quicker. In the UK, we're seeing significant um, usage and increasing usage of our, we've 50% we've of the Tesla charging capacity in the UK on our, on our welcome break sites. And we're seeing those growing year on year with significant growth. In the U in the US, we see less of an adoption, and we see some usage in Connecticut and Massachusetts, where where we've got some uh, charging facilities there. A lot less in our locations in Florida and South Carolina. Uh, similar to Warren's point, the people there like their big big vehicles, travel a long distances, and it's not suitable as of yet for electric. So I think you need to get specific, but I would say electric is here to stay, and uh, the adoption will get faster and faster in cities. Oh, very good. I mean, just as we're on cities, I mean, uh, I think you know, one, one point to bring up, um, and, and Nick, maybe we could bring up some of those London photos. Uh, I spent sort of um, a day, enjoyable day on, a, on an electric bike um, going around London, which is not something I'd normally uh, risk doing on a bike, but it's possible at the moment because it's so empty and obviously uh, it's summer still or August still. Um, nevertheless, um, you know, if you just, we just take you through the photos, London does seem very empty. You see people like Leon, um, you know, this is lunchtime uh, on the South Bank um, would normally be packed Nero Express in King's Cross Station, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, nobody there. Um, you know, it's, uh, and then I think the last photo I took was, uh, was uh, at Euston Station, um, 5.30 p.m. last night. Um, normally I wouldn't be able to move through that station at that time because it would be like a football crowd. So, you know, there's, there's a huge, uh, obviously there's a huge change in, in big cities like London that depend upon public transport because uh, commuters aren't coming in and using that public <coughs> transport during rush hour. In the evening, um, those cities, particularly Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, with the government scheme, you know, are really busy. So people are coming into the city centre, but they're not coming into the city centre in the way they used to. So, I mean, you've, you've all raised that point. I mean, and today we had the announcement that pret a are, are, are cutting 2,890 jobs, wow. which is a third of their workforce in the UK. Um, uh, there's some big, big things happening in cities like London, aren't there? Yeah. Well, we found in, in Dublin, um, Dan, there's a number of roads have been sort of halved for sort of bicycles and walkers and they're sort of gone instead of having two-way traffic flows, it's only down to single, uh, single direction and uh, that's been getting more and more adoption and during the summer now we've never seen as many people out cycling and sort of buying bikes, using bikes, that, that sort of stuff. So I think, yeah, there has been a change and I think it's a shift that will, that, that is, is here to stay. Can you see a, a, a station in the future which has a great convenience offer, you know, but is, is designed for bikes as opposed to cars, but and is in a sort of urban space which doesn't really 
isn't focused on 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 cars and uh, and and road transport, but is is on focused on pedestrians and and cyclists, scooters, that kind of thing. Um, I, it's possible. I mean, uh, and we're looking at an option where you might get, let's say, multimodal switching. So before you just had, let's say, trains or cars coming in. But you'll probably see more and more of these uh, stations becoming multimodal hubs uh, where you would have much more, uh, much, let's say, much broader use. So it's just like you and your electric bike, you'll be able mm -hmm. to have other ways to switch and switch in and out. And I think you'll see more options. Mm -hmm. Well, Joe kept quiet, so he's probably wish he, he's probably glad I'm not head of his design. Uh, yeah. After that, <laughs> well, so. I think, uh, pro property so yeah. valuable in, uh, in cities, Dan, you're uh, sorry. I don't think it'll be, you, you have enough space for that sort of thing, but if there is a change in customer. And I think the fact that we're, we're local and if people are on bikes, they then carry, they can't carry as much as in cars. So again, it's back to that point of extending the life of the local petrol filling station, I think is, um, is key. And I hadn't heard that statistic before. Sophia said about 95% um, of the population live within five minutes of a, of a petrol filling station. Uh, 20 minutes. Or 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah, yeah, 20 so. minutes. It's very close. I think that's yeah, that's important. Yeah. Which is interesting because that then allows then uh, to use petrol stations as uh, as distribution nodes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, I mean, I, I increase in our. Um, yeah. Do you know that the, the lockers where people get deliveries to to sort of lockers between Ireland, the UK, and the States, the the usage of those have has has gone through the roof. It's very very popular. Mm. So Warren, um, any last thoughts from, from you? We're pretty much uh, at, at, the, at the end of the program. Yeah, I was just gonna say, Joe, you might find that the, the uh, price of real estate does come down in the, in the cities. Um, in Adelaide, where essentially there are no restrictions anymore, I think about the only thing is you can't have more than 10 people to your place. I think uh, Google activity says that in this absolute CBD, the, the center of the city, uh, activity is down about 25% still. So e even where there's almost total open up, there's been a complete change in the way people are living their lives. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, affecting small stores downtown, etc. And I think goes to your, your right point of supporting those suburban uh, petrol stations as being the hub of, of where probably the future actually lies for us. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's a great uh, point to, to, to bring it to an end, I suppose. So you've heard it here first, you know, uh, petrol stations are, are here to stay uh, for the for foreseeable future and they have an extended life as the, as the hub of their community. So um, sounds pretty positive to me. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Warren, Sophia. Great. Well, um, just to, just to uh, thank, uh, thank Warren again for, for joining us so late at night and Joe, uh, Joe from Dublin and Sophia from London. Um, I thought that was a fascinating discussion. Um, uh, just amazing how much things have moved on uh, it, since, uh, you know, since the last, uh, last time we spoke. Um, just to look forward to next week, um, we, uh, we're here again uh, next Friday, 2 p.m. UK time, 4th of September. We've got something which is, I think, very interesting, uh, a very interesting program for you, uh, professionalizing our industry. We're really looking at um, how our industry, we're thinking about career development and how we, we, we make ourselves better. Uh, not many books have been written about the convenience industry, but Jakob Scram, who of course we all know from his uh, time at Circle K, um, has written one very good one. And Jakob is now CEO at Norwegian Airlines and will be joining us next week, as will Frank Gleason, uh, Pablo Andone, and Daniel Hooker. Um, Frank, Pablo, and Daniel are going to be talking about a lot of the, the ed executive education that's going on. These are NACS programs that are incredibly successful and I think important in our industry. So we're going to have some very interesting thoughts in how, as an industry, we professionalize and um, help create long-term careers uh, for, 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 for your people. So. Um, if you've got time, uh, join us again next week. I think it's going to be fascinating. And uh, uh, until then, thank you very much for watching and see you soon. Good afternoon. <laughs>